Welcome back to the farm. Today we are going to be diving into a very cool topic that's all about giving your seeds the best head start, inoculation. And don't worry, it's not as intimidating as it sounds, but it is a little bit sciencey. So if you're a fellow soil geek like me, you're going to really like today's video. It's actually very, very simple to inoculate your seeds and it makes a huge difference in the success of your plants. It's one of the things I absolutely do not skip. First off, what even is seed inoculation? Basically, it's like giving your seeds a probiotic boost before they hit the soil. You're coating them in a special mix of beneficial bacteria or fungi that make them build a better connection with the soil. So why do we want to do this? Aren't fungi and bacteria bad for plants? Well, not necessarily. In fact, just like in our guts, in our bodies, there are good microbes and those microbes need to be present in order for our bodies to function. The same thing is true of seeds. This comes down to the soil and nutrient uptake. Certain plants like legumes form a symbiotic relationship with specific bacteria to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. So without that correct bacteria present, we've talked about this in our cover cropping videos, specifically when we're using peas or legumes, they can't do this efficiently. And that means less nitrogen for the plant and for the soil overall. And that's where inoculants come in. That's one example of where inoculants can come in, right? So they make sure that the microbes and the bacteria that the legumes need in order to fixate nitrogen is present. But there are other benefits as well. So take mycorrhizal fungi, for example. Mycorrhiza is something that we talk about a lot here on this channel. And we talk about it when we're doing things like starting our seeds. We talked about it in our most recent seed starting recipe video. And mycorrhiza fungi, that specifically is very helpful for the plants because when the plants form an association with the mycorrhizal fungi, for example, that fungi forms an association with the plants and it forms these little hyphae that go out, they look like little hairs, little root hairs that go out and they spread out into the soil. And so they are an extension of the root and they serve to help the plant uptake more nutrients, more water from the soil profile around them in the rhizosphere. They're helping the plants get more nutrients from the soil profile. Now, another thing that happens specifically with bacteria, for example, is the rhizophagy process. So rhizophagy process being a really neat interaction between the soil microbes and the plant, wherein the plant actually eats in a way it absorbs microbes within the soil profile through its roots and it extracts the nutrients within those microbes into the plant and then it spits back out the empty cell of the microbe and that empty cell actually forms an extension of the root and then that process reoccurs. So those microbes go back out they reabsorb nutrients, they get reabsorbed by the plant in this cycle. It's a great way for us to be able to extract more nutrients from the soil profile without having to add fertilizer. So this is why we talk about not over adding fertilizer a lot here on this channel because what it can do is actually inhibit the ability for your plants to have this interaction with the soil food web and it keeps them from being able to uptake nutrients like they should. And this is something that is very, very important when we're talking about our farm project in Minnesota. So one of the things that we are focusing on and we're going to be talking about this more as we get into spring is the fact that we are dialing way back on nitrogen inputs on our conventional corn farm in Minnesota and we are making up for that by adding more living nutrients to the soil. So more things like inoculants, which is what we're talking about today. It applies to home gardens, it applies to market farmers. This can also be scaled all the way up to conventional farm. There is a specific inoculant that you'll wanna use, and that is nitrogen fixing as a spirillum. When you're looking for nitrogen fixing, even if you're not looking for it as a cover crop. So we talk about this when we're talking about planting peas as a cover crop to get more nitrogen into your soil. Of course, those are terminated before we ever harvest a single pea from that plant because we want to keep the nitrogen in the soil instead of the plant using it to create peas. Now, if you are doing cover cropping, we've talked about this in our cover crop class, there are different ones that you'll want to get. If you're using a reputable cover crop seed website like greencoverseed.com, they will give you the correct inoculant to use. All right, but what about for plants that aren't legumes? Is it still helpful to inoculate? Yes, and that is because it will give you faster germination and healthier plant starts. It's going to give you better nutrient uptake, like we said, especially for nitrogen, but for other micronutrients as well. And stronger plants that are more resilient to stress because again, that 
hyphae fungal network that's going to spread through the soil. And as a bonus, you're going to be improving your soil over time. So even though we're inoculating our starts and our seeds with that, that does make its way into the soil profile and it's going to help improve the health of your soil overall. There are other mycorrhizal inoculants. You don't have to use azospirillum because again, this one's specifically for nitrogen fixation. I actually like to use this product and I like Bigfoot. It's very reliable for me. It has performed very well for me. That doesn't mean you have to use this one. And at the end of the video, we're going to give you an, another option that doesn't require purchasing anything. Um, but this is Bigfoot as well. And this is their granular transplant that's a root inoculum it is omri certified i always look for the omri certification on anything that i'm applying to my garden because i want to make sure it doesn't have any biosolids in it and omri certified means it can't contain biosolids that's human waste by the way which contains pfas or forever chemicals that's why i go for omri certified and this one actually has a few other things in it as well that are also going to help your plants. So this is the one that I add to my seed starting soil. It's also one that I use to inoculate my seeds when I am starting them. Again, this isn't the brand that you have to use. I've used other brands with success. It's just the one that I found to be the most consistent. And this one also contains some humic acids and it has some biochar and some worm castings in there as well. Those can all be helpful, especially in seed starting. So it doesn't take much of this to get it to work, okay, just a little bit. So a bag like this goes a really long way. So how are we going to apply our inoculant? It's very, very easy. All we do is we dampen our seeds a little bit with water, or you could even use a water that's mixed with a little bit of molasses. You're going to sprinkle your inoculant over your seeds. It doesn't take much. Like I said, a little bit goes a long way. You just wanna make sure that they're all coated somewhat. So these are very microscopic. All of these microbes and these fungi, they're microscopic, they're tiny. Others don't have to be wet at all. So for example, this azospirillum is actually very powdery. It can be applied dry. And then the other one, I actually prefer to wet the seeds first just because I find it helps it stick a little bit better. So you could also, we mentioned in the seed starting video, if you don't want to rub it onto the seeds, you could also put a pinch of this into the hole when you are seed starting. Just put a little pinch in there. You could do this outside in the garden as well. Just put a little pinch right into the soil as you're direct sowing your seeds or as you're transplanting your seedlings in. Okay, so an example of when we would want to just inoculate directly into the seed starting hole is with small seeds. So for example, we have these straw flower seeds and they are quite small. I mean, not as small as some of the smaller ones we grow, for example, like poppies. But let's say that we were doing something like poppies and they are quite small. If we were to mix in inoculant, so sometimes the inoculant can be so big, it can look like seeds itself. So if that's the case and you're dealing with a very small seed, I would recommend just putting a pinch of this into your planting hole. But for example, when we're planting with a hopper and we're planting corn on the farm, inoculating first before we are putting these into the hole is gonna be the way to go. It can be helpful to give them a secondary boost. So yes, at planting of seed time, and then at transplant. If you're transplanting out to the garden, it can be helpful to do a second dose then. Here is a pro tip. If you've watched all the way here, you get a pro tip bonus, which is only inoculate right before you're going to plant. Don't do this a week, two weeks in advance. These are living products. So number one, you're gonna to wanna to keep them in a cold, dark place. Not in the sun, not in the heat, okay? That will kill them off so they are living products. Especially once they are wet, they are activated, and at that point, we don't want them to dry out again. Treat the seeds that you are planting that day. So what happens after we do this inoculation procedure? So we already mentioned the rhizophagy process. These microbes are going to work forming partnerships with your plant roots, between your plant roots and the soil. It's going to give the plants access to more nutrients, more water, this helps the plants access nutrients and water more efficiently. And in return, the plants give them exudates, so sugar. So plants don't just do this out of the goodness of their heart. They also put out exudates into the rhizosphere around their roots. And that helps attract more microbes and the fungi that those plants want to form associations with. So it's this kind of one-to-one -one interaction. And this is again, why we don't wanna over apply things to our garden. So when you see someone telling you, put this tomato fertilizer on your tomato plants once a week, it's because they are trying to sell you fertilizer. <laughs> you don't need that. And if you start doing that too much, your plants get lazy and they stop forming these associations because they don't have to. Then your plants become dependent on fertilizer and your soil becomes dependent on fertilizer. Your soil life isn't getting the exudates that they need because the plants aren't putting them out to attract the soil food web. 
so it all collapses. The more things you apply to your soil, the worse off your soil is gonna be. So I mentioned that we are taking this a step further by even bringing this to scale on our home farm. I can't wait to show you guys how we're gonna be doing that. But we are going to be inoculating all of our seeds, the corn that we are planting, here in 2025 season will be inoculated with a product from Advancing Eco Ag. And the theory is that that's going to help us apply less nitrogen to the corn than is conventionally traditionally applied, lowering our overall input cost. All right, now let's talk about when you might use homemade compost versus purchased inoculant. Here on the channel, I like to talk a lot about not having to buy things for your garden, and that's true of inoculants as well. I've given you a couple options if you need to purchase, but if you have a very active, healthy compost pile at home, you can use that as an inoculant and skip the purchased products. So if you are doing a compost pile of a diverse range of different ingredients, not just one ingredient, not just animal manure, right, but a lot of different scraps, garden components, grasses, some manures, a variety of things, leaves, then you have a lot of different microbes active in your compost. So you can use that the same way you would this. Just take some finished compost, you can sift it out, wet your seeds, rub it on, or you can apply a pinch directly to your seed starting soil right into the hole so that there's contact with the seed. You do want contact with the seed and just use it the same way that you would an inoculant. So this is a great option if you're looking to save money, especially if you have a nice active compost pile. And remember, you can go back and watch our compost video for that. And that's it. That's the scoop on inoculation. It sounds intimidating. It sounds very cool. You can start telling your friends that you're inoculating your seeds to get better rhizophagy processes. And, and mycorrhizal fungi hyphae. <laughs> and they'll all think you're really cool, right? We're, we're all cool. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Until next time, keep growing, keep learning, and we will see you guys around here next time at the farm.